Great, so I have uh, just a few questions that I'm gonna ask Matthew, um, and then we'll get to audience questions right after that. Um, so the first thing is, and this is an example um, from I think the eight phases of dating that you made. So as far as creating content, can you talk a little bit about the creative process that you go through and kind of what inspires you and what makes you think of the things that you create? Sure, I mean, like I said before, if I'm actually really stumped, uh, I, I do the thing where I make a list of nouns and I, I connect them around, like um, connecting dating to these little blobs or whatever they are. Um, I've also found surfing a lot of other sites uh, for insp inspiration really, really helps. And most importantly, when I create something, if I'm, if I'm laughing at it, if I'm giggling at it as I make it, I know it's good. Um, or if I'm reading it and I'm like si sincerely interested in it, it's good. Um, maybe I'm just, my, what I like is in line with I think what a lot of dig users like and a lot of Reddit users like. So understand who you're writing for, I guess, if you're a nonprofit or if you work in the automotive industry, um, you probably actually are more inclined to create bait for that industry and be better at it. So, so do you ever find yourself working on something and you, you get to kind of the end of the product and you look at it and you say, you know what, this is something, this doesn't make me laugh. This isn't really what I had imagined. What do you do with stuff like that? Um, well, you know, a lot of the time I try to keep my investment low. So if it only took a few hours, I'll, I don't feel, you know, too terrible about it. But um, I'm real hesitant to seek feedback from others, especially with humor. Um, but just because, you know, they have the best intentions. But like I said, if you have 12 people and you're doing a joke, you're going to come out with something terrible. Um, but I don't know, keep iterating, keep playing with it. Um, look at what's funny that's similar to that and see what, see what works and what doesn't. Great, okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about the, the kind of the time you spend. You mentioned that you kind of limit the time that you invest in those kind of things. Um, up here is a screenshot of Mingle 2. Um, and why don't you give us a little background on that and then tell us about the process in creating it. Sure, so yeah, this is the dating site. It doesn't look like this anymore. This is my version of it. Um, you know, with this site, I was actually a little nervous about making my own website. Uh, I'd always worked for firms, and this was my first real baby out of my own, so I felt like I had the whole world watching me. So one of the things that I wanted to do was make this as, uh, put as little work into it as possible. Make it, so that way if it failed or if, if it went under, I hadn't spent six months working on a product. So I actually built, I designed, coded, conceptualized, and launched this entire thing in 66 hours um, using uh, a combination of, um, active or uh, uh, um, rapid development frameworks. So you guys might have programmers out there who use things like PHP or Python or Perl or, or, or whatever. There are these frameworks that what they do is they take all the heavy lifting out of programming. And um, I know it's kind of a different topic than what this is about, but you can make stuff so fast now. That's why teams of like uh, startups often, have, they have two guys, two or three guys. They have the biz guy and they have the programmer. There's, there are no Gantt charts. There are no Aaron shares. There are no meetings. There are no offices. It's just uh, very low overhead. And that's great because if this had failed, and I'd put, uh, if I'd gotten a million dollars in VC funding and hired all these people, that would be a mess, you know. But instead, it was very, very uh, low, low overhead, which is what I like. So, so once you create something that, you know, spins up in 66 hours, you put this work into it, or something smaller like a quiz that takes two or three hours, how do you go about launching it? And what, how much time does it take, I guess, to see the effects of getting on Dig, those thousands and thousands of page views? Usually any viral campaign, you'll know within 12 hours of whether or not it's going to work. Um, Sometimes I've seen somewhere you'll launch them and then like they'll, they won't really do anything. And then like two or three days later they'll pick up. But usually, especially with Dig, Dig, if you submit something to Dig, you have 24 hours for it to basically be promoted on that site. That site works sort of like, suppose the New York Times let people feed them articles and then everybody voted on what we're going to read today. Um, and then whoever got the most votes would show up. That's kind of what Dig is. You vote on what's promoted and then you get all the traffic. Um, so with that site, it's pretty obvious. If you, it's like two or three weeks out, and your viral campaign just is not picking up, um, I would just let, let it die. It's not going anywhere. Great, okay, so kind of on to that. Um, once we've created a, a viral campaign, we've launched something real quick, um, and you say, you know, within the first 12 hours, we see it start to spike. How do you sustain that traffic? How do you use it? Um, well, that's the thing about link bait is that in viral marketing, what I've noticed is there's this huge upward curve where you get this massive amount of traffic and then it just trickles off. So you can't really. I mean, it's like I said, it's more of a gimmick. It's, it's something to get people to link to you and either get them to look at who you are, or to build links and then rank at the search engines. Um, yeah. Okay, so, I, so the, the screen grab I got here is uh, another game, how many colors can you name in five minutes? I did red, white, and blue. So I can name three, and at the end of it, it gave me this little badge. And I know you mentioned the, the badges before for the uh, how many five-year-olds can you take. Can you talk a little bit more about how those badges work with the search engines and actually create that traffic that, that drives back those links? Yeah, yeah, so the badges, this is really important with these quizzes. What, what they do, like I was saying before, is 
Um, when people take these quizzes, taking the actual quiz itself isn't that fun. You guys use all, all use Facebook, and I'm sure your friend feed is flooded like mine is with these stupid what Batman are you type quizzes. You know what I'm talking about? Um, so what that shows you is that people are more interested in sharing their results. So with these badges, like the one you see on the right, um, really the core of this is someone has a completed a task about themselves and they want to share it with everybody. That gives you an opportunity to give them a little snippet of HTML code, which gives you an opportunity to get a link from them. Um, that's the primary benefit. The second being, those badges go on other blogs and that sort of, uh, it makes the traffic flourish a little bit longer. Uh, my comics, I was talking a few seconds ago about how the traffic spikes and then drop, drops down. That's for a lot of the comics and stories I've written. Um, the quiz is actually, a lot of the time, it's a, it's a lot longer spike because what will happen is as it surges up, all these badges get installed and it just keeps flourishing and flourishing across the blogosphere. So I love quizzes. I think they're a great way to market a website. Great. All right, so the next slide I have is about some of the tools of, of the trade. And this gets back more to kind of your past in traditional SEO. So can you talk a little bit about your time at, at SEO Moz and making some of these tools? Sure. Yeah, so I worked at SEO Moz. It was a, marketing for, a search marketing firm. Um, and I built a lot of SEO tools to kind of give you an idea of uh, some were, of them were very advanced, some were very basic, but the, it was to, to give you an idea of how SEO worked and to, to start you off on the path to becoming an SEO. Um, I've only actually built two of those, two or three of those. Linkscape was after I left. Um, but Linkscape's a really cool tool if you want to, like, let's say you do a link bait campaign, like, um, you know, the bunk beds, uh, Tyrannosaur one. And there's another bunk bed site that's outranking me. Linkscape will give you a better idea of why he's outranking it. Well, that's suppose I didn't have enough links or something. Linkscape could help me um, figure that out. There's a few others on there. Term target will look at the page and decide if you're using your, your keywords properly. Um, Backlink Analyzer, you can look at who's linking to you. So if you guys want, check it out. It's seomoz.org, seomoz. Um, they've got like tons of articles. They've got a beginner's guide to SEO that'll probably cover stuff that I just completely glazed over. Um, so yeah, check it out. And, and as far as like I know, the uh, I guess the page strength tool that's now the trifecta tool. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how that? How, how does it measure where you rank? How does it know how strong your page is? How does it? How does that work with kind of the search engine? So you know. A page ranking at Google, um, it depends on a lot of things. And one of the tools I built tried to put all those together and so you can get kind of a snapshot of why you are or are not ranking at Google. Um, some of those factors, I mostly covered links in this because I wanted to talk about link bait. Um, but some of those other factors include uh, the keywords on the page. You know, if you want to rank for Houston singles, is that keyword on the page. Um, the age of your domain, believe it or not, has a huge amount of, makes a big difference. If you have a domain that's like, 10 years old and you want to rank for a competitive keyword, uh, having an old domain helps. Google likes that. Uh, more importantly, if you have old links. So if I'd done my, uh, my uh, unicorn comic like 10 years ago, those links would actually be more valuable than they are now. Just how Google's algorithm works. I think it's a, mostly to prevent, prevent spam. So, and there's a few others. There's a few other factors. But uh, it's called the trifecta tool now. And it sort of will give you a snapshot of how powerful your, your site is. So if, you like, if you're up against somebody else, use it for competitive analysis. And these are just a few of the tools that are available at SEO Moz. Um, I didn't print all of them here. Are there any other ones that you'd like to mention or tools that you use to kind of measure some of your traffic? Yeah, um, seobook.com, first of all, has a great guide on SEO. I think it's like 79 bucks. Um, Aaron Wall is a super smart dude. But he's got a free tool there as well if, if you want. Um, it's sort of like a, it's an SEO toolbar that you install into Firefox. Works really well. It gives you a snapshot of a lot of things I was talking about. How many links you have. Um, what your compete rank is, and some other metrics that are useful. Great. And then as far as, uh, as, far as measuring the traffic that you get, what tools do you use to do that? Actually, um, I use Google Analytics for the big stuff, like the long term overall, like, oh, my site got X page views last year. Um, for viral campaigns, though, I use something called Mint. And uh, it, what's really cool about it is that it lets you see in real time who's linking to you. So with Google Analytics, there's kind of a lag to everything. With Mint, it's instant, and it's actually really addicting because what you do is you'll sit there all day hitting refresh, like looking at who's linking to you. It's like, oh my god, I got on, I got, like two weeks ago, I got on Comedy Central's blog, and I was just like, oh my god, refreshing all day. But it feels like you're working, but you're actually not doing anything. It's really great. <laughs> um, so yeah. Oh, Mint. Uh, Haveamint.com. Or just Google the word Mint. I think it's the second, second result. So. Great. Well, that's great. That's a great set of tools, and um, I know I definitely I use the SEO book toolbar. I use Google Analytics. I use a few of the other tools at SEO Moz. So thanks for sharing about those. Well, thank you. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, we you know we took a look at some of the comics that you made, some of the quizzes, those types of, of link bait. 
This is actually uh, an image from an article that you wrote that was kind of a link baby article about um, doing design and having other people messing your design up. And I know you've mentioned having 12 people design link bait isn't the way to do it. So can you talk some about kind of writing link bait? Sure. Um, you know, like I was saying before, this is actually one of the first pieces of link bait I ever did. For, it was years ago at SEO Moss. I was talking about the title of this was How to Ruin a Web Design. Um, you know, and I think the important thing to take away from this is, despite your opinions on web design, the title of it, How to Ruin a Web Design, that got on dig like instantly. I mean, those guys would jump right on that because um, a lot of them had, have suffered like I have suffered uh, in big meetings before. Um, but this, uh, yeah, it's basically talking about how if you have, you know, design maybe not necessarily, this, this isn't true, it depends on who's in the room, but with link bait, if you have a lot of people, if, it's, if it becomes too intense of a discussion and you're in, in Gmail or whatever, going back and forth, 45 times with revisions to something, it's probably not going to be so good. So having like a, a agile company really helps with this kind of stuff. Somewhere you can kind of jump from foot to foot, make changes without having to have a big process. So. Cool. And I know you mentioned uh, crack.com before. Uh, some of their articles that you read and you find yourself after you read one, you click on another and click on another. Can you talk a little bit about what it is, the way that they write, some of the kind of the construction behind that and how Perhaps some of the people here could use that in some of the, the perhaps the link bait that they write. Yeah, it's just it's this formula they've got where I mean I don't think they invented it, they just have seemed to have perfected it and that's all they've created at this point. So it's articles like I was talking about where the thing is titled like um, uh, the top ten most frustrating video game uh, villains. So like I don't know if you've ever played um, I think it was uh, Sonic the Hedgehog and there was like, there was this one level with this one enemy where it was just frustrating. It was unfair. Everybody hated it. Um, so writing an article about that is going to appeal to the geek crowd. It's going to appeal to the dig crowd. So if, you're, you know, um, if your website is about uh, the environment or something, you want to try and maybe find an angle on the environment that, that pertains to that. And maybe it appeals to geeks or social media enthusiasts or Twitter. I mean, if you, like I was saying before, if you can get a lot of traffic from Twitter, um, that's just great. You know? and, Oftentimes to do that, you take your product and you attach it to something relating to uh, something crazy, weird, funny, or interesting. So. Great. Um, one other thing I want to kind of touch on is, is as far as, I know a lot of your stuff is fun and it's quirky and it's, it's real kind of entertaining things that bring back links, but I know there's also people out there that write very controversial articles. I know there was a, an article earlier this week kind of trashing SEO and SEO consultants and it, while it, it stirred up a lot of traffic and it eventually kind of got refuted, it still built up a ton of links and a ton of buzz all at once. So do you have any experience writing kind of controversial link bait? Um, not anything newsworthy. Um, I have done a few times. I've only actually done it twice and it was a desperate situation. I uh, lied and I made up a fake news story on a website. Um, the client paid me to do it. And um, we did it simply because the subject had, I had absolutely nothing to write about it. it was, I'll tell you what it was, it was wedding favors. Um, they're like these little flower things you put on tables when you get married. I'm a, I'm, I'm a pretty creative guy. I could not come up with anything. So I made up a story about how I made these wedding favors um, and I used a fake person, put it on a, you know, it wasn't attached to Matt Inman or the oatmeal. And um, it actually did really well viral. It got a ton of traffic. But uh, the story was about how I made wedding favors and I, they were like out of salmon. They were like a, almost like an entree. And um, it gave everybody the runs at the wedding. And I wrote this illustrated story about it and I drew like an uh, atom bomb coming out of the toilet and stuff. So that's about the closest thing that I've done to that. I know some people have some crazy success with it, but I just don't think it scales very well. There's a guy in SEO, I think his name's uh, Lind Lyndon Andcliffe, Lindo Man, and he made this fake news story up about how a 13-year-old um, a kid used a credit card to buy a prostitute, used his dad's credit card. And this was on Fox News. It was like, I think I got uh, 16 million page views. It was totally fake. And they found out. And um, his company was, was, got a really bad reaction from it. I mean, everybody was just like, oh, you freaking liar. So <laughs> if you're going to do it, be careful. And I just don't think it scales. Mingle 2, I'm not going to sit there and make fake news stories all day. Um, but stirring up controversy certainly helps. I just don't know, again, how much that scales. Because stirring up controversy gets both positive and negative. So if you're constantly drawing both of those, that maybe not be, not be a good thing. So. Great. All right, we'll have a few more questions, but I know that I know we're going to have questions from the audience, so I'd like to open it up right now um, to anyone. We have a few.